I think that my favorite job that I ever had was working at Walt Disney World. I was originally hired as a food and beverage cast member and was on the opening team for the All-Star Resorts, or All-Star Sports Resort. And I started out as a cashier in the cast cafeteria. It was very unglamorous. I prided myself, however, on remembering folks' names and checking them out quickly and sending them off with a smile. I served all of my fellow cast members. I served housekeepers, I served the front desk, I served the custodians, and I served the vice presidents and presidents. Working in that cafeteria actually helped me move my way up through Disney. And I had a lot of fun, but I was anxious to serve real guests. And I finally got to move out to the food court, and I just couldn't wait. I wanted so badly to be part of other people's Disney vacations and be part of the Disney magic. I love Disney, so these were my people. For the most part, they really were. But some of them were really not. Really not. I was amazed at how many people just couldn't seem to be satisfied. Nothing was good enough, and they just wanted to complain. And they bewildered me, they honestly befuddled me. Here we were at the happiest place on earth and these folks just seemed like they wanted nothing else. They just didn't want to be happy. Why does it always rain on our summer vacation in Florida? I don't know, you came to Florida in the summer. Why can't we take Mickey balloons on the rides? Why is our room the furthest building from the food court? Why don't you guys serve Dole, Dole Whip? Why didn't my child get picked to be in the parade? Why are there always cartoons on that giant TV out here? What do you mean the guest in front of me got the last Mickey straw? They had so many good things that were available to them, even if it did rain an afternoon or two or four, but they could only point out the things that didn't satisfy them. They were always looking to tell somebody else what they thought they deserved. When I finally left Disney, I thought that I'd left all that behind me, but it turns out that that habit rears its quirky little head and quirky little monkeys, too. I want milk, but I don't want this milk. This milk is funny. I want strawberry milk, and not that weird kind, not the powdered kind. I want the kind with the rabbit on the front of it in the squeeze bottle. I want sneakers, but not plain sneakers. Everybody has white sneakers. I want sneakers with characters on them, and I want them to light up when I walk, and I want them to make that cool ripping sound. I don't want laces, but I don't want three straps on them. I only want two. And if they got those milk, or the sneakers, or the book, or the robot, or the sports equipment, or the phone, they were happy for a little while. But sooner than I usually liked, they were back again asking for something else. And I'd get frustrated because it seemed like they were never satisfied with what they had and that they were always wanting something more. And it turns out it's not just Disney tourists or quirky little monkeys who are like this. The crowds following Jesus weren't satisfied and they wanted more as well, even after he just healed them and fed them and had all sorts of compassion on them. So we're back this week in the Gospel of John and we're in chapter 6, starting with verse 22. And it says, the next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. And once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and they went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs that I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. So this is the morning after Jesus has taken the young boy's lunch of five small barley loaves and two small dried fish. This is a poor man's meal. And he's offered thanks to God for it and multiplied it so that over 5,000 of them could be fed and could be satisfied. So this next morning, the crowd wakes up and they realize that Jesus is gone. And they've been with him for a few days now. He's taken care of all their diseases and he's preached to them about God. And they don't know what to make of him, but they know they want more of him. 
So they just keep following and, and just they'll take whatever he'll give them. And they check the boats and they're confused because they watched the disciples leave in the only boat that was there. And Jesus had gone up on the mountain to pray and he hadn't left with his friends. So here's something else that they can't quite understand. And these crowds that are following Jesus, they're kind of like Alice in Wonderland when she goes through the looking glass. She knows that everything that she finds just gets curiouser and curiouser. Everything she thinks she knows has been turned upside down and inside out. And all she can do is follow the rabbit who she thinks has all the answers. So these curious crowds, they get into their own boats and they find Jesus on the other side of the lake and they ask him, when did you get here? But this question is about more than time and it's about more than logistics. It's about who are you? How did you get here? How did you come to be here with us? What does all of this mean? And they're also asking, just by following him, are you going to feed us again? Because it's time for breakfast, and there's still no means of food around here except you who multiplied all this bread and fed us last night. And Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, listen up, y'all. This is important. You aren't fooling me by following me. You're curious about who I am and what I'm doing, and you like the things that you see and you hear. But I know the bottom line is that you're hungry again, and you want what you think I can give you, which is more food. Jesus says, I'm offering you more than a meal here, more than a message, more than a miracle. I'm offering you eternal life, and you just don't even see it. You let your stomach growling for bread and fish get in the way of recognizing your invitation to the most amazing banquet that you could ever think of or imagine. We read Psalm 23 a few weeks ago, and it says, God prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. No matter what's going on in our lives, no matter what we're up against, no matter what we're facing, no matter what battle we think we might be going into or whether we think we're already defeated, God prepares a table for us, and it's a banquet table. God anoints our head with oil like the good shepherd anoints the sheep so that those insects don't burrow their way down into their heads and drive them crazy and cause them to hurt themselves, and so that they can find rest, which is rest for their souls. And it says that our cup overflows. And the very picture of this speaks to a satisfaction beyond what we can understand. Because if our cup is overflowing, we have more than we can drink. We have more than we need because God provides more than enough for us. And they couldn't see it, even though Jesus was standing right there in front of them, and he was fulfilling prophecy in front of them, and he was having compassion on them, and he was teaching and preaching and healing and saving, and he was offering them a life more abundant than they could ever imagine. And they're crowding him, and they're just wanting more barley loaves and more fish and more miracles. And Jesus says, don't keep going after the things that aren't going to last, that don't matter. Go after those things that endure, that remain, that abide. Verse 28 continues. It says, then they asked him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So then they asked him, well, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said, sir, always give us this bread. And this crowd is so confused. I can imagine that I would be confused too. What do we have to do to get this food that doesn't spoil? How do we please God enough to earn this kind of food? And Jesus says, y'all just have to believe in me. And they scratch their heads a bit and they say, you know what? Wait, wait a minute. What sign are you going to give us so that we know that you're who you say that you are? How do we know that it's really going to be you? And which is crazy if you think about it, because I don't think anyone else is going around making the paralyzed walk or making the blind see or raising their children from the dead. How many signs do they need for them to believe? And they even mention Moses feeding the Israelites in the desert with the manna from heaven, which you would think would make them stop and go, hmm, 
This sounds like what Jesus just did when he multiplied all of that bread. Could that be a coincidence? And Jesus corrects them. Moses isn't the one who fed those Israelites. That was God. God caused bread to fall from heaven for Moses to feed them. God is the one who multiplied that bread last night so that I could bless it and give it out to you. God is always the one who provides. God gave to the Israelites. God gives to the crowd. And God still gives to us today. The bread that God sends from heaven gives life to the whole world, every single one of us. God gives us the bread that gives us life and provides everything that we need, and it's more than enough. Our cup overflows. And the crowd is hanging on every word that Jesus has just said. They're almost salivating at this point. Sir, please, always give us this bread. We don't want anything else but this kind of bread. Verse 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. I am, ego I me, the very name of God. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So I talk about the Disney tourists, right? And I talk about my monkeys and them not being satisfied or not believing that what they had was enough. And I compared them to the crowds following Jesus after the miracle of feeding the 5,000. But I would also have to compare them to us today, to me. We often think that what God offers us is not enough and that it doesn't satisfy. And we look to the world to give us what we want and what we think we deserve. But we live in a world that has gotten more and more impatient. We want things to happen now on our schedule, in our timing, and we do not like to wait. We used to have to wait to connect to the internet, do you remember? with the dial-up and the AOL, for several minutes when the lines would get bogged down, and now we get mad at our technology when it doesn't do what we want the second that we hit send or enter. We used to have to wait forever to rent the latest hit movie at Blockbuster. We would go in there and we would see all the videos and they would all be empty and we would be like, oh, we miss it out. And now we have Netflix, and movies are just streamed right into our living rooms. No more late fees and no more be kind, rewind. We live in a world of Amazon Prime. If it, something takes more than two days to arrive, we are decidedly not happy. We order prepackaged meals for each day of the week to be delivered with all the ingredients already sorted out and mixed up for us. We don't even want to wait on lines at Disney anymore. So we get fast passes, and we schedule them 30 days out so we don't have to wait on the day that we actually go. And don't even get me started on all the faces and all the phones that don't talk to each other while they're on those lines. We fill our lives with quick and with easy, and we don't really want to work too hard, and we don't really want to wait too long for anything. But anything worth anything requires some kind of investment on our part. God plants this beautiful invitation for a relationship in our lives before we are even born, when we are knit, before we are even knit in our mother's wombs. It is ours to accept or reject, and there is absolutely nothing we can do to earn it, and there's nothing that we've ever done to deserve it. It's a gift of grace, and all we have to do is accept it, and it's ours. Eternal life is ours. But if we accept it, and we do nothing with it, it cheapens it. And it makes it very unsatisfying. Marrying Gary was one of the best things that I have ever done in my life. But if I had said yes to him and never invested in our relationship, I would have cheapened it. I'm pretty sure that we wouldn't be satisfied with our relationship and that we'd start to believe that it wasn't enough. We'd be withering because we wouldn't be abiding in each other. It's not hard to invest in a relationship, but it does take time. It's hard to have a relationship with someone that you don't spend any time with. And God offers us so much more than same-day shipping and rock-bottom prices and Good Friday sales, so much more than quick fixes and easy outs. God offers us a life that endures, a cup that overflows, and a hunger and a thirst that is absolutely and completely satisfied. And I read this book last year by a woman named Deidre Riggs. It was called Every Little Thing. 
in one of the chapters, she talks about a dark time in her life where she felt she wasn't really sure about God's faithfulness and God's provision. And for some reason, one day, she just decided she was going to mark each time that she absolutely knew that God was working in her life, that where something happened and she could say, I could only point to God and know that that was God that did whatever it was. And she hoped that that would help her to trust God more, but she didn't have high hopes for this little endeavor. So she'd take a stone from her front planter on her front porch, and she would just put it on a tree stump by her back door. So it's just the process of picking up that stone, walking through her house, and putting it on the tree stump. And she didn't expect much, but the first day, she had two stones. And over the next several months, she wound up with this huge pile of stones, enough that folks would ask about it because it was obvious that they weren't there by accident, that someone had put them there on purpose. And her relationship with God grew in that small investment because even on the days where she might not move a stone from the front porch to the back door, she'd pass that trunk or she'd see it from her window. And the evidence of God's love and mercy and grace was overwhelming. She was still in a dark time. It lasted for a while. That hadn't changed, but she knew without a doubt that God was still there and that God was still working and that God would continue to work in her life and in the lives of others. And she knew that she could abide. It was enough. So my challenge for us this week is to become more aware of our relationship with God, to become more aware of where God is showing up in places that maybe we don't expect God to show up and providing bread for us. No matter what kind of season we're in, whether we're on a mountaintop or in a valley, whether we're healthy or we need some help, whether we're struggling or we're comfortable, God shows up in our lives. Sometimes it's just not where we expect. And I would challenge us to mark this in some way. It could be moving a stone from a planter to a stump, or it could be buying a bag of beans or marbles and putting them in a mason jar next to your kitchen sink. It could be gathering a bunch of twigs and putting them in a, in a uh, pitcher and tying a piece of yarn or ribbon on them every time that something happened. It could be stickers or stamps or stars or something you put on a piece of paper that you just hang up on the fridge. It doesn't matter what we do, just that we become more aware and we mark the times that we can say, God, I know that was you. It could be big, it could be small. It's probably a lot of small things. Small things add up to so much bigger things. Those small things are sometimes the big things. Deidre under, underestimated God, and her faith became strengthened in a way that she never expected. Marking those God instances was a turning point, even in her darkest hours. God promised us the bread of heaven, which gives us life. And when I stand up here and I preach, <laughs> I'm giving us breadcrumbs. I hope that it makes us hunger for the real bread that never perishes and that leads to life. When we gather together as a church family and we take communion together, we are receiving the bread of heaven, the bread of life, again and again, week after week. And I always remind us that it's not me who invites us to this table, that it's Christ himself who invites us to meet him in the meal. And I always ask the Holy Spirit to pour out a blessing on us so that that bread that we receive may truly be for us the body of Christ so that we may be the body of Christ for the world. The bread of heaven is here. We come together, not so much for the breadcrumbs that I offer, but for the bread of life that Christ offers. We bring Christ in with us. That bread of heaven comes in with us, each one of us, because he lives inside of each one of us, inside of each one of us through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives and breathes and moves and works inside of each one of us. And I pray that we bring that bread back out into the world every week and that we are a part of the bigger thing that God is accomplishing out in the world all around us. And maybe through us, Someone else can move a stone from a planter to a stump and say, God, I know that was you. Amen? amen. And amen.